Hey guys, this is John with Bar from Standard Tutoring. In this video, I'm going to explain substitution and elimination reactions. So my advice to you is to use this video either as a preview for substitution and elimination reactions or at the end for a review. And there will be multiple parts of these videos. So I've written up here the four reactions you will see, substitution and elimination reactions. These two here are the bimolecular reactions, and that's indicated by the two at, at the end of SN or E. So bimolecular meaning one step, and SN1 and E1 are the unimolecular reactions, and this is indicated by two steps there. So let me go through each reaction and um, show you what it actually enhances those reactions and the mechanisms of what's going on in each reaction. So the first one is our SN2 reaction. This is the first reaction you'll probably learn. Bimolecular substitution, SN2, one step. And this is the main mechanism that's going on here. We have a nucleophile attacking our alpha carbon, and at that same time the leaving group is being kicked off and we form this product here where the nucleophile is now attached. What's important to know here is that there's an inversion where these two, product, where these two attached groups here, the both R groups, meaning just carbon groups, are now on the other side. And that's because the nucleophile and the leaving group need to be far away from each other, and so the nucleophile coming in pushes the R groups to the other side. So what is a characteristic of the SM2 reaction? Well, we want a strong nucleophile, we want carbons that are either um, zero area or primary. So an example of a zero area one will be a CH3Cl, just attached to three hydrogens and one leaving group. The rate for an SN2 reaction depends on both the leaving group and the nucleophile, and it's best enhanced by a polar aprotic solvent. Let's go on to E2 here. E2 has this mechanism, all right? The base is now attacking instead of the nucleophile. The base is going to attack the beta hydrogens, so the beta hydrogens are attached to the beta carbon. That means it's the carbon next to the alpha carbon. Again, the alpha carbon indicated here, the alpha carbon always has the leaving group. So instead of the nucleophile attacking that alpha carbon, the base is coming to attack the beta hydrogens, forming a double bond, and simultaneously kicking off the leaving group to form a product such as this one, with the double bond present. What is the characteristic of that? Well, we have a strong base. We can use either primary, secondary, tertiary carbons, Again, the rate is dependent on two things, the leaving group and the base, and are best enhanced by a polar aprotic solvent. So in both cases, you want a polar aprotic solvent. Well, I just said strong nuke for SN2 and strong base for E2, so what does that actually mean? Well, a strong base, you can say, is something with a pKa greater than water. Okay? That's a good uh, middle ground there, and good to know that water is around 15.7, so anything higher than that is technically or relatively a strong base. Strong nucleophiles usually have negative charges, okay? So if you see a nucleophile with a negative charge compared to one that doesn't, you can safely say that's going to be a stronger nucleophile. If you have a good nucleophile and a weak base, you're likely going to get SN2 products. If you have a nucle good nucleophile with a good base, you'll probably get both, okay? Because a strong nuke and a strong base is indicative of either. And then a weak nuke and a weak base moves us to SN1 and E1, which are the next two reactions I'll go into. So these two are the unimolecular reactions. You're going to have a two-step process. The first step is always this one, the box step here. The leaving group leaves. And that may, do, that may be due to weak conditions, a weak nucleophile, and a weak base because the leaving group just leaves. It doesn't have time to sit around and wait for something to happen. So if the leaving group leaves, two things can happen. If we're doing with an SN1, we have the nucleophile can come in and attack that carbocation spot now. So remember, so this leaving group left, we're going to have a carbocation. So an empty pure over shell here, this nucleophile can come and attack either plane here. And that's how we get two products. We have the product here with this enantiomer, because the nucleophile can attack either above or up, uh, on top of that carbon, which is planar, by the way. So it's just in the board. So think of the nucleophile attacking from the top or the bottom to form both products here. So what are the characteristics of SN1? Well, we have a weak nucleophile. We know that because the, the leaving group has to leave. We have a secondary tertiary carbons. The rate is only dependent on one thing now, and that is just the leaving group. And we want a polar protic solvent. Next, going on to E1, we notice that since the leaving group left, of course, now the base can come in and, and again take off those beta hydrogens. So once it does that, the double, the double bond is formed. Again, like in, S, in, in E2, the double bond is always formed in elimination reactions. And you form this product with its diastereomer. So what are characteristics of E1? Well, we have a weak base again. Uh, secondary, tertiary carbons, just like SN1 here. The rate is again dependent on one thing, and polar protic solvent. So in the case of SN1 and E1, you want polar protic solvents because it stabilizes that carbocation. All right, so mechanisms for both unimolecular and for bimolecular reactions here. 
know these. These are general ration schemes. Again, they'll be varying depending on conditions and what are actually attached. The, pre the following videos will outline uh, in more detail conditions for all these reactions. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope this was of help to you.